I'm sorry? Oh, we're ready? Good evening and welcome to the Supper School Committee meeting of Monday, June 26, 2012. Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item two, public input. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Anyone from the audience wish to address the school committee? Anyone? Seeing none, call this meeting to order. Roll call, Mr. Secretary. Mr. DiGregorio? Present. Dr. Domingo? Excused. Mr. Jovian? Present. Mr. Lazo? Present. Dr. O'Leary? Present. Mrs. Principe? Excused. Mrs. Woodruff? Present. Five present, two excused. There is a quorum. General M5 consent items. Warrant number, which is to be assigned in the amount of $78,007.63. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Five, yes. Motion carries. Warrant number also to be assigned in the amount of $142,761.05. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. Roll call. Mrs. Woodrum? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Dr. O'Leary? Yes. <coughs> Motion carries. Agenda item six, approval of minutes of the regular school committee meeting of June 12, 2005. Uh, 12. So no. moved. Second. Any errors, corrections, or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? I abstain, Max. Motion carries. Reports, the representative of the Student Advisory Committee is not with us until the fall. Presentations, we have none. Uh, we'll do a presentation under the superintendent's, superintendent's report. Thank you. Report of the superintendent, <coughs> Mr. Ely. Yes, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to re recognize uh, nine teachers who are retiring this year. After many, many years of service, I think total uh, they were around 260 years of service. Uh, Lenore Brigham, Ann Dingle, uh, Felissa Donato, Phyllis Donato, uh, Maureen Ferry, Angelina Gosselin, James Haskins, Don Quigley, Gloria Settle, and Marianne Tinsar. <clears throat> so that's a, a Lillian. Uh, oh, and Lillian Lynn was added, I guess, later, you're right. Uh, we also have some uh, resignations and retirements uh, in the administrative ranks. Mr. Zangi has accepted assistant superintendent position. Uh, elsewhere and will be leaving us in later July, in July and Mr. Riley has accepted a middle school TS, uh, uh, principal position in Worcester uh, and will be leaving us at the end of July. So we have quite a few positions to fill uh, but I uh, rest assured that we're working on those and as you can see at the bottom we've started to fill the positions that are in the new vocational program uh, that we're moving from the collaborative up to the old high school. So we are starting to fill these positions we are currently in the process of interviewing for the Director of Pupil Personnel Services to replace Mike Meyer, who will be retiring uh, in, on his birthday in November. And uh, we are getting ready to start uh, uh, interviewing for the Director of, uh, I'm sorry, the Director of ELL we've been interviewing for, the Director of PPS uh, will fill, uh, we're getting ready to start interviewing for as well. So uh, we have a number of positions that we will be interviewing for over the next few uh, uh, next month or so, and certainly when we get to round two with the administrators, we'll uh, uh, have school committee members uh, represented in that and those uh, level two hiring committees. So uh, that concludes that portion of the report. I'm going to move you. to the podium for this one. Hopefully this thing's working. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to, to bring your attention to the fact that we are at the end of uh, year two of our strategic plan. Uh, tonight, I want to celebrate the things that we've accomplished and talk about where we're going next. 
Uh, this could take all night, but it's going to try to take about an hour to go through each of the initiatives that we've put into place uh, since I became superintendent. And uh, a lot of those things have happened in the last year. Uh, and then we'll talk about where we're going. This is sort of color coded, so the black is the actual uh, activity or strategic object, uh, strategic in, uh, activity. Uh, the red is uh, what we've already done, where we are now, and the green will be where we're going next. And I'm sorry, Mr. Lazo, for using green, but I just couldn't get the blue to show up very well. So, sure. uh, <laughs> so let's start. Uh, this is our first goal. Uh, we'll improve student performance. Obviously, that's always our number one goal. Uh, but a focus on instructional quality and ensuring access to a high, highly uh, aligned quality <coughs> curriculum uh, for, our, for our students. Uh, I won't read each one of the, uh, the actual, in, uh, you, have, you have a copy of this there, that the actual strategic uh, activity, I won't read to you, but talk about where we are. Our ELA and math teams, you've had presentations on, so you know they're working on aligning to the Massachusetts frameworks. Uh, they have uh, started to develop a schedule of assessed standards, and most of those are complete or nearing completion. Uh, and uh, this will give our, give our teachers some, some necessary guidance in, in what to teach when over the ne uh, next year uh, so that our students can master the standards in time to take the, the, the state assessments. So as we go through the next year, we'll be uh, using those teacher teams uh, repeatedly throughout the year to finalize that schedule of assessed standards, continue the mapping of the units, uh, and some individual data lessons, but the individual data lessons will be done mostly by the classroom teacher. They'll have some discretion about how they want to accomplish the, uh, the, the unit, how they want to teach the standard, but, but, the, uh, but the, the order in which they're taught and uh, the time frame that they're taught is, is, is going to be pretty strict. Uh, so they'll finish that throughout the 2012-2013 uh, school year, just staying ahead because the, the standards kind of came out late, so we're just trying to, to, to get ahead by a couple of months and then continue working throughout the next year to finalize that schedule aligning to the frameworks. Uh, literacy plan is in place and is being implemented as we speak. We'll continue to implement that literacy plan and we will continue to monitor that through our learning walks and uh, both at the district level and the, and the building level. And uh, we will start using teacher participation in the learning walks uh, more extensively at the beginning of next year as well. The numeracy plan took a different uh, approach uh, because we didn't want to wait an entire year to, to develop a numeracy plan and we were already in the process of, of aligning to the new Common Core Standards and the new, uh, the new Massachusetts Frameworks, uh, we have decided to kind of create the numeracy plan as we go. Uh, so we'll be finalizing a numeracy plan as part of that schedule of assessed standards and the unit and lesson mapping that we're, that we're doing uh, for next year. As you know, we've uh, experienced some, some implementation difficulties with our benchmark testing. Uh, we've assessed where we are. We've continued to do some Galileo testing throughout the school year, and we finished up in June uh, before the school ended. Uh, but that's really the last we're going to use Galileo. What we're going to do is go to a, an extensive and very regimented uh, set of, of assessments uh, called formative assessments. Uh, that, will that will assess where our students are in those standards along the schedule of assessed standards. Uh, in grades two through five or two through eight, we'll be using uh, the uh, uh, achievement network, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, like exactly what we're going to be using. Uh, when we talk about next year, we're going to implement uh, a, a K-12 formative or interim assessment program. At, uh, We'll use the Dibbles and the Degrees of Reading Power and a locally created math assessment. And we currently use these in K-1 already. We're going to continue to use those. Two through eight in ELA and math, we'll use the Achievement Network. And uh, we are right now looking at both uh, locally developed and uh, commercially available ELA and math assessments for grades 9 through 12. We'll have those decisions by the end of the summer and ready to implement in the fall. Our data management plan is, uh, is working uh, uh, in, in the works. It's not finalized. Julie Fields, I think she's here this evening. Uh, our, da our data manager uh, has created a database in the IPASS system. She's bringing all this data into one place, into, a, in a, into our database. 
uh, so that it must, it's easier to create reports that we can then disseminate to teachers and to administrators and to our data teams. And then the district data teams are in place uh, across the, uh, in the district, at the district level, but also building level data teams are in the process of, of being formed in each building. Uh, and we are going to be training our teachers and using a, a structured uh, data inquiry model for, uh, for next year. Which tells you where we're going next year. Uh, we're going to analyze trends across all the buildings and grade levels to identify areas of improvement relative to the curriculum gaps and any instructional weaknesses that might be documented. Uh, the building data teams will analyze individual students and in classroom level kinds of data. The district takes a little different approach, a broader approach, looking at the total, um, total uh, three through 10 grading system, uh, both in ELA and mathematics. The district will create and implement a, a, a software plan. This was something that was sort of my, uh, uh, my desire because when I came into the district, our software was sort of all over the map. We, we had put in software for years and years and years and some had dropped off not being used but we were still paying for it as a license kind of situation. So we put a stop to that. So we placed a moratorium on any new software coming into the district uh, and until this plan is finalized. What we're doing at this point is we're going to develop that educational software plan in conjunction with our five-year technology plan, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but that software plan is extremely important because as we go around the district doing like learning walks, we see some software is being used very effectively, and we see others being used not quite as effectively. We want to have a good handle on that before we put a software program into place. Our professional development program is in place for next year. Uh, we are very, very focused next year on uh, data, uh, and we're going to be do using um, some, some very uh, sophisticated, quite frankly, data analysis techniques, which will require us to do a lot of training with our staff. So most of our training next year will be on how to use the assessment data coming out of our interim assessments as well as our MCAS assessments and any, any uh, state national tests that we might, might be, be taking. Uh, but it's extremely important for us that our teachers are able to use the data effectively. I think it's easy to say, hard to do, uh, but this data inquiry model uh, will follow along with our schedule of assessed standards and then the interim assessments. The data that comes out of it will then be evaluated and analyzed by our staff to identify curricular needs and or instructional issues that we're having and then we'll put into place any kind of uh, uh, intervention that might be necessary. So this year as we do, as, as our teams are going through the process of mapping the, the assessed standards and mapping the units, what we're finding is that, especially in mathematics, some of our materials don't map exactly to the new Massachusetts frameworks. So we're identifying where our, our current materials do match and then we're filling in the blanks where they don't. So that as we're doing our uh, work this year, our teachers have been uh, very, very careful about identifying s supporting materials that will help them attain those standards. We're also creating a continuum of, of interventions, both in ELA and mathematics, that, uh, that will be used uh, by the teachers and the staff within the buildings to intervene with those students who are struggling. So as we go into next year, We'll assume that we have a schedule to set standards in place for both ELA and math. Uh, we will have mapped at least the first few units uh, going into the school year, the first few months of units, and then we will have already scheduled the assessments. The students' daily lessons will then be reflective of, of what that schedule says, so that the standards are make, make sure that the standards are mastered before we get to the assessments. And then once we take the assessments, we'll do the data inquiry. It's, it's a very, uh, it, it's a pretty sophisticated approach to doing things. It's very sequential, uh, but it also requires a lot of training and a lot of attention to detail by our staff. And like I said, uh, when we did the presentations from the teachers, this is really not easy work and it's not fun. Uh, the teachers make it fun a lot of times, but, but uh, it really takes a lot of hard work and thought that goes into making this, this work. We have evaluated our Title I program. We've changed our Title I program this year. Uh, we'll change it again next year in light of the new configuration. 
uh, our Title I staff in both ELA and math uh, will be spread along the three elementary schools. Uh, the interventions will be in place, a continuum of interventions, and uh, they'll be targeted to students based on uh, the need determined by the performance on those uh, formative assessments uh, as part of that schedule of assessed standards. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of themes that are kind of threading their way through this, this entire strategic plan and, and uh, I think I'll stop for just a second because I think I, it's really important that I'm throwing this out there very quickly because there's 147 slides tonight, two for each one of the things that we, are initiatives that we put into place. It's extremely important for me to for everyone to understand that even though I'm going through it fairly fast, the work has been going on for a year and a half, two years, led by some very able administrators and some very conscientious teachers. It's extremely important that we recognize the work that they do and to understand that you know we don't sit around uh, thinking about ways to make life difficult for people. It's really about trying to make things better for our kids. So, uh, As I told you when we went to the two one through five buildings, uh, we will need to develop a, a, a comprehensive K-12 gifted and talented program uh, for our students who are already at advanced levels. Uh, we have not yet written that plan, however, Talented and gifted classes have been scheduled for grades one through five as well as grades six through 12 for next year based on students' performance uh, in the past. Uh, and uh, those programs will be implemented as we go through uh, and we'll work with our teachers on a regular basis to try to develop some sort of a written uh, program. But right now, it's important for us to get the curricular work done and then we'll look at how we're going to supplement that curricular work for the students who are already working at or above grade level. That's extremely important in my mind if we're going to stop the flow of school choice students out of our district that we start to challenge our students who are already working at or above grade level. It's extremely important that we don't forget those kids. Because in a district like ours, as I've said before, we have to teach kids where we expect them to be. And if we're already there, we have to push them even further. We can't rest on that. And I think parents uh, sometimes will take their children out of school, you're going to hear that in a little bit, out of our schools and take them somewhere where they think they're being challenged at a higher level. We have to do that here. We owe it to our students, and that's one reason we're doing the, uh, uh, the, this talented and gifted program without something in writing. We've identified the teachers, we've identified the students, the classes are being already have been formed by the principals, uh, working with the teachers, and uh, we already have some teachers who have an expertise in this area working with this program. So. The technology, uh, as you know, in the new building, the technology is extensive. I was just having a conversation with one of the young men here tonight working on the, uh, the TV set about what all the technology is going into the new, the new middle high school. And uh, it's extremely important that our teachers are able to use that technology effectively to enhance instruction. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, we believe that as we move into the new middle high school and train our teachers in August, to use the new technology, the integration of technology into the, the, the curriculum to supplement the curriculum, but also to support the curriculum and instruction will, will take off, uh, even more so than it has already with teachers using their own initiative. Because now every teacher is going to have the interactive whiteboard, they're gonna have clicker systems, they're gonna have uh, uh, not laptops, but tablet computers. They're, they're, they're gonna have access to technology they've never had before. Uh, so we're training them in August. And everybody keeps asking what's going to happen to the technology that's in the old high school and the old middle school. That technology is geared to go into the elementary schools in the fall. So as you can see from our next step, uh, we have an inventory already of, of uh, or we're, 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 it should be finished by now. Uh, we have an inventory of what equipment and, and a technology we have in those two buildings, the Cole Avenue building and, and also uh, Wells. What we'll do next, once school year starts and we get everything up and running, uh, in the fall we'll start looking at where we have a need for technology in our elementary schools. And we'll start slowly moving that technology from those two buildings into our, middle, into our elementary schools where it can be used most effectively. Uh, so where, as you may not have more than one smart board or interactive whiteboard in an elementary now or two, next year you might have six. So it's really gonna enhance the technology capabilities of our elementary teachers. It's just not gonna happen right away with the, with the move to the one through fives and the moving into the new middle high school. I think we got our hands full over the summer. Uh, we can't do that before the fall. 
and I'll, I'll go back and we are targeting we did oh I don't know what I did oh I gotta go back a ways Uh, we are targeting Thanksgiving uh, to get that technology all moved out of the elementary, out of the middle school into the elementary schools. I'm sorry. Somehow I went straight to the end of this thing. I'm sure everybody would be happy if I just stopped there. It's a little warm in here. We're going to blame Mr. Zangi on this. Since he's leaving, I can blame him. Okay, there's where we are. So we're targeting Thanksgiving to have that technology installed in the new locations. Uh, the Accelerate Instruction will move all students to on grade level instruction. Our learning walks have been really valuable in helping us give feedback to our teachers about the things that we're looking for and what high quality instruction looks like and the importance of rigor in the classroom. Uh, as well as having appropriate intervention strategies and techniques into place. We've done all of that this year. We'll continue to do that next year. Uh, but as we go into the model of ex in accelerated instruction, particularly in grades K through 5, uh, we'll continue to monitor this because I think it's extremely important that we push our students as far as they possibly can go. And then when they think they're going about as far as they can, push them a little bit further. And I think we need to do the same with our teachers. And our teachers believe in this. It's, it's, uh, it's a different way of thinking for us, uh, but I, I really think that as we do our learning walks and we provide feedback to, t to teachers about what we're seeing in terms of rigor, higher level questioning, and uh, students actually truly engaged in the learning, I think you'll see uh, dramatic improvement uh, in, our, in our scores. Uh, as we assess the instructional supports uh, that are in place, our integrated service model I think has been quite successful. You saw a presentation a couple weeks ago by our staff on how that's working some places. Uh, we've been monitoring that through our learning walks. We've some, seen some very effective models. We've seen some less than effective models, but we see more effective than we see not effective. So we just continue to provide <laughs> feedback where we see a need to improve and positive feedback where we see things going really, really well. Uh, uh, we use Dibbles in de degree of reading power assessments, and we've looking at those just in a cursory way without truly analyzing the results. We've seen some pretty significant gains from our students in Dibbles as well as MCAS, or, or as well as the, the degrees of reading power. We don't have the MCAS results back yesterday yet. Uh, on Friday of last week, the state released some preliminary numbers to us, uh, which are in some places encouraging, other places I haven't had a chance to look at yet. but. Particularly in grade three, our math scores look very, uh, very encouraging. Uh, but, but we'll get more with, with that when we get some finalized data from the state on the MCAS results. But we believe we see some, some, some uh, improvement. I want to, I want to caution people that as a district uh, gets to level four, it takes a while to get there. As you know, you, you've been through it, and you've been digging yourself out of there for a while. And we're on, we're on the brink of being kind of getting our head above water now. So I think. We just have to keep working really hard because that last few feet to get over the top is the hardest. Uh, as you know, once you've climbed as high as you have, it's easy to slide back, and we've got to make sure we keep pushing hard. Uh, so we've, I've put uh, uh, some, I've given my math director, uh, Tammy Peralt, who's here tonight, and uh, Karen Ryan, who's here tonight, uh, in math and literacy, uh, some very strict orders uh, that they're to have into place a written continuum of interventions available to teachers next year for students who are not reaching the levels we expect them to reach and then that will kick in as students on the data show that they need the extra interventions. Uh, so we'll continue to mo monitor that. We have, <coughs> you'll notice that I'm talking about in here two different kinds of learning walks. We've been doing really one kind of learning walk where the superintendent with a bunch of central office administrators goes in, pairs up with the high school, or the principal, maybe a few principals from different areas, and uh, goes through a building and, and gives the teachers feedback. That will continue to happen. Those are called monitoring learning walks. In our accelerated improvement plan, we are now transitioning from just doing the monitoring learning walks to doing now monitoring learning walks from the district level, but also building level learning walks with the, with the principals leading a team of teachers uh, into other buildings to see what good instruction looks like in other buildings. For example, next year, you'll see the principal at Charlton Street and teachers from Charlton Street going into West Street to do learning walks. 
you'll see the vice versa. West Street principal with teachers going into Charlton Street. You'll see high school teachers going down to, the, to, to Eastford Road to do a learning walk. You'll see Eastford Road teachers going up to the high school. So the idea next year as we do these principal-led learning walks is to get our staff really engaged in looking at instruction, but not in their own building. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, there's a little bit of a chance of, of pushback and there's a little bit of chance of, of some negative influences if you jump right into doing learning walks in your own building. So we're going to ease into it and for a year spend time going to other buildings and then the following year our plan would be to implement learning walks in our own buildings. So uh, the learning walks are extremely important because it gets the principal uh, uh, out into the role as the instructional leader. I know Diane's here tonight. She's been on a number of learning walks with us. Uh, and and uh, all of our other principals have as well. So I think they're ready. They have built the capacity over this year to lead learning walks on their own. Uh, but we'll still work with them to make sure that they, that they facilitate those things uh, effectively. Uh, we have not done anything with the National Board Certification. Uh, this was a Race to the Top initiative. Uh, we have one teacher, I think, in the district who is nationally board certified, maybe two. Uh, National Board Certification is, a, is extremely rigorous. Uh, it's a good thing for teachers to do. Uh, it, it's it's uh, on par with doing almost doctoral level work uh, from a teaching perspective. Uh, unfortunately, it's very expensive and we had funded it through, we had decided to fund it through the Race to the Top, uh, but our Race to the Top funds uh, may or may not support that next year. Uh, we will be assessing that in the near future to look at where we are with our Race to the Top funds and decide whether or not we can afford to send some teachers to this National Board Certification process if they wish to go. We do have a team of teachers, two teams of teachers actually, uh, going to pre-AP training uh, and we've sent teachers to the AP training as well. Uh, that's scheduled for this summer. And I think it's really important to understand that the pre-AP training that we're sending these teachers to isn't really about how to teach AP. It's really about rigor. It's about how to get our teachers thinking in terms of making their level of instruction more rigorous for students, but also providing the support that students need to, to achieve that. So we'll train teachers this, uh, this summer. It's a long process. It takes two or three years to go through this uh, of, of sessions in the summers and things like that. Teachers working together. Uh, it's designed to increase uh, teacher knowledge and skills in the ways classrooms can, can uh, the inc uh, increase the rigor in the daily classroom work. Uh, it's, if you combine that idea with the idea of doing accelerated work in grades K-5, I think you can see where we're headed. We're heading toward building capacity in our student body to do very high level AP and, and high level uh, international baccalaureate work if we choose to go down that path. So I think that uh, we will see increases in the MCAS, the AP exam scores, and also the SAT scores as we start creating a rigorous environment for our students. As we go through uh, the review of programs uh, in special education, as you know, we've, it's been a struggle for us to maintain or to, to uh, uh, control the cost of special ed as with everybody else. Uh, we have finally got a handle on it, I think. Uh, the integrated service model has been instrumental in, in kind of keeping the cost down. Fewer and fewer students are being sent out to out of district placements because we're providing the services and the intervention right in the classroom uh, in some pullout situations as well. Next year we'll continue to monitor that. We'll review the data from this year uh, and we'll adjust the integrated service model to, to ensure uh, that we are using our personnel effectively and that we're also promoting the use of research-based interventions for students. Um, and it's extremely important for us, if we're going to avoid identifying students as special ed, to make sure that we're providing the support students need to be successful. If there's a gap in their achievement, we have to intervene, and we have to intervene with increasingly rigorous and increasingly more restrictive kinds of interventions until our students catch up. Slowing down doesn't work. Uh, it's been tried. It, when you slow down, you just tend to fall further behind. It would be like in a NASCAR race. If you slow down because everybody's passing you, guess what? More people will pass you and they'll be further and further ahead. The evaluate, uh, 
the use of out-of-district placements we've done. As you know, we are, uh, have already decided to move two classes back from, from out-of-district placements into the district at the, new old, uh, the old high school in Cole Avenue. Those programs, you saw some of the hires for that program, those two programs uh, in the packet tonight. We'll continue to do that. We'll also continue to market this program. As we get better at it, we'll market it to other districts. And then we'll also be examining all the other students that we have in out-of-district placements to decide whether or not it would be appropriate for us to start a similar program uh, or better program in our own district to save money, but also to serve the needs of our students closer to home. Because when you do that, you do two things. You first of all keep kids closer to home, and you also reduce your busing costs. You also increase the employment in town, and you meet the needs of students, I think, where they belong, which is in your district. Provide service to eligible students in least restrictive environment. This is the integrated service model at its finest. Uh, this was why we put the integrated service model in place. Uh, it's extremely important that we constantly evaluate it. We've been evaluating it all year. Uh, it's also important for us that we use an RTI approach. The RTI stands for response to intervention. And that is once you put a student in an intervention, you do progress monitoring. So if you put a student, for example, uh, Dr. O'Leary, if, if you put a patient on a medicine, then you're going to see them periodically see how that medicine's working. But when we put a student in an intervention, we do what we call progress monitoring. We, four weeks and six weeks out, we look at where the student is relative to where they started to decide whether or not the intervention's working, like you would medicine. If it's not working, then you're probably going to change the medicine, and we're probably going to change the intervention. Uh, what we're struggling with right now is getting to that change of the intervention. And I think it's because we don't have the continuum of services in place yet, but we will by the fall. Uh, and that really is why our school-based support teams are so important, because the school-based support teams are the ones that do the progress monitoring. The actual assessment is done at the, at the classroom level, the building level, but then the, the team, the school-based support team, actually analyzes the data and moves the student from intervention to intervention as needed. Uh, we sponsored a parent camp. As you know, there's still, I think, posters on the wall in the back. Uh, we plan on doing that again. Uh, we did that in conjunction with the special education department. Uh, and uh, the special education uh, department, I know, has worked with parents to start a new uh, parent advocacy committee. Uh, the PAC has been held meetings in April and May, and new officers have been kind of preliminarily appointed for the rest of this year. Uh, we need to get really better at this. This is, I think, a weakness for us. Uh, so we need to, when we bring our new Director of Pupil Personnel Services on board, it needs to be a priority to make sure that that PAC continues to work uh, effectively uh, and continues to get more active uh, with the parents in our community that have students that, are, that have special needs. Uh, so it's going to be a big job of the new PPS director uh, to, to continue this effort. I also have in here that the new director of PPS will give you a quarterly report on where we are with the PAC. And, the, and I would hope that the, that the members and the, the, the leadership of the parent group will come to you and, and, and give you periodic updates as part of that uh, quarterly report. Uh, we will... Uh, uh, we obviously are trying to get to a more collaborative approach of instruction, model of instruction, where we are integrating our Title I or ELL and all of our uh, special education services in an integrated way. And that's what we've been talking about with the integrated uh, model. Uh, we started that in September. Uh, we've been observing it through learning walks and evaluating it through learning walks. We'll continue that. Uh, we need to get a little better with our ELL students, uh, providing the services they need within the classroom. Some of them are still being pulled out too much. Uh, and in the middle of all this, the SEI, the Sheltered Immersion Training, is now obsolete. It's not even being offered at the state level anymore because we're going to the new uh, WIDA, which is, stands for World Class Instruction Design and Assessment. We're going to a new WIDA consortium uh, guidelines, which is going to require us to really rethink how we uh, uh, are serve the needs of our ELL students and how we assess their progress and what the role of the, the school-based support teams in that analysis will be. Uh, we had, as part of our Race to the Top initiative, the idea of uh, providing licensure help for teachers who wanted to go back and get licensed for special ed. We have not really done that in a proactive way. We have done it 
uh, and we will continue to do it through the approved coursework. We have many teachers who work for us now who go back and get additional coursework. Uh, many of them, or some of them, will go back and get special education endorsements. Uh, we do pay for that as a district up to a certain amount contractually. Uh, this is also a race to the top initiative, which the funding is kind of hinky for right now. So we'll just have to, to, to evaluate that as we go. But we still hope to continue to do that. Uh, we hired an ELL director. Uh, she's since resigned. Uh, so we're in the process. We interviewed today for the ELL director. I think they interviewed six candidates. Uh, I received three names uh, to go to the next level. So I'll be talking to the school committee over the next week or so about uh, who wants to be part of that uh, selection committee uh, for the new ELL director. We had a good candidate pool for this. Uh, I was, uh, the, the, the committee that did the level one interviews was very impressed with the quality qualifications of the candidates and was very happy with the interviews. So uh, we will hire a new director uh, of ELL and they will then become part of our team in terms of uh, assessing the integrated service model. Unfortunately, we have a, a, a history with some other administrators here who have been part of this already. Uh, and we have a, a lot of teachers in our district who have been very vested in this, so, so they uh, uh, will help us bring this person up to speed. Uh, the targeted assistance, it really models, the ELL sort of models the, the, uh, the special ed because the idea behind the integrated service approach was to take the, the resources that we have in our district for ELL, special education, and Title I and use them to help students regardless of what their classification was, for want of a better term. We've been very, very successful at that, and we think it's going to continue to be helpful and successful. Uh, the, uh, the middle high school uh, takes a little different approach, but it, it's still uh, a work in progress, but they are still working on trying to get this uh, up and running at those levels. It's just harder because they're spread out in different classes so much. But we will continue to do the uh, implement the integrated service model. We'll also implement the new WIDA assessment and analyze student data as we do with all other students. Uh, just these students have to take another assessment uh, based on their language acquisition skills. Uh, One of the things that has been mandated for many, many years in the state of Massachusetts is the sheltered immersion training. So teachers who, who are uh, working with ELL students or ha have been required to take special classes to teach them how to work with ELL students. Many of our teachers have had those, but now they've been, as I said earlier, now they're out of date. They're not offering them anymore, so we have to go to the new WIDA consortium uh, training. Uh, which will, is just starting to become available. Uh, just recently has the state actually signed that onto that consortium, but we knew it was coming a long time ago. So as we go through, we'll implement the required training for those staff members and, and those new regulations and, and uh, the new assessments. Uh, again, same sort of situation here. This was another race to the top initiative to get help, help teachers get certified and endorsed as ELL teachers. We have a number of teachers in the district, by the way, who already have this endorsement. Uh, so I think, I think we're we kind of sort of got a, a leg up on a lot of districts because we have a lot of teachers who have done this on their own. Our job here, I think, is just to continue to, to identify teachers who want to get that certification and try to find a way to help them through race to the top funds or through the local uh, aid that we give teachers to, to go back and get extra education. Uh, the Human Resources Plan is in place. Uh, Mr. Wigan and uh, Katie Jaress, my administrative assistant and Human Resources Manager, have been working very hard this year to get all the forms and everything into place and get the teachers and our administrators to follow the protocol. Uh, we have a little bit of work to do on that, but we're getting better. Uh, and, and we'll continue to evaluate our Human Resources Program, uh, but we are getting much, much better uh, the mentoring component, I would say, is not where it needs to be. We do have a mentoring program, but it's not as formal as we'd like to see it be. So as we go through and we implement the new HR uh, plan, we will train our administrators on what our expectations are, specifically in the hiring. Uh, as you know, we had a, a, a recent case that, that requires us to train our administrative staff uh, on the anti-discrimination, non-discrimination in the hiring practices. Uh, we're gonna have that training in August. Uh, it's about a four-hour training, a half-day training. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be done by somebody from the MCAD, which is the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. It's a good thing. Uh, what it does is it prevents, uh, it prevents a district from making mistakes. 
based on uh, any kind of discriminatory practices. So it's a good training for us to, to give our administrators as part of our training in August. Uh, we've worked with the SEA leadership throughout the year uh, to start to talk about how to implement the new educator evaluation framework. Uh, we, we have uh, some people who are working on the actual kind of draft of what it would look like if we matched our contract language with the new state model. And then the plan would be as we go forward to actually present to the school committee a joint recommendation for language that will change the language in the current contract. That's a sort of a really interesting process because we sort of are told because we're a race to the top district we have to implement the new educator evaluation framework. But if you have it in your contract, you have to negotiate it. But in our case, it's been a pretty good working relationship between the administration and the union teachers. Uh, there's a couple little hitch points, I think, and then we felt it was better to actually come jointly to you, administration and teachers together, uh, before uh, and, and say, you know, we've we've come to this conclusion. Where do you want to see us go from here? Because I think it's important that everybody realize that starting in the fall, every employee in a district, in a any district that's in a race to the top uh, has a race to the top funds, has to implement the new educator evaluation framework from the superintendent all the way down. Uh, every every position has a different way of evaluating now. Um, so we do a lot of training. We have to do a lot of training, one, uh, the least of which is actually writing SMART goals. Uh, our teachers write goals now, but the, running a SMART goal has to be follow, uh, follow a certain template. We have eliminated waivers. We no longer have any staff members in our district who are on waivers. Uh, and that will continue. Uh, the only way we will hire somebody and have to do a waiver is if there's nobody else out there that has certification for the area we're looking. We were worried in a couple areas this year, uh, but we were fortunate already and we found an engineering teacher. Uh, we found a couple of other uh, 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 positions that are difficult to find, uh, but quite frankly there's a lot of people out there looking for work and education right now and, and so certification is easier to come by and we haven't had any problem with this. But. Uh, uh, what I will say is, is if I have to do a waiver, it'll be a one-year waiver. Uh, that's, they're all one-year waivers, but you're allowed to get two or three in a row. And, and when I came here, we had 12 teachers on waivers, and, and now we don't have any, and I don't want to keep it that way if I can. Uh, we've implemented a, a new superintendent's job description, the evaluation process is in place. Uh, that will transition over to the new uh, framework next year. Uh, and the superintendent, I, I will have to write SMART goals, uh, as, a re as all race of the top districts are required to, to do in, in 2012. Professional development will continue in those areas that we find highly effective. Uh, we, have a key, we had a keys to literacy training today at the library. A number of teachers were involved, uh, and the feedback on that I saw briefly in the conference room before we came out here. Uh, was very, very positive. The teachers love Keys to Literacy. The feedback from the kids has been very positive. Uh, there are some areas we need to work on, but again, we can work on that through our uh, daily interaction with teachers and also as our learning walks. Uh, so as we go through and implement the Keys to Literacy initiative uh, in our day-to-day -day inquiry model and the school-based support team, you're going to see a lot of things starting to move in a, in a common direction as a district, which was what the original plan was intended. Uh, we will train, uh, will you provide training as part of a professional development plan in the WIDA regulations, the new educator evaluation framework, the Southbridge standard, and other mandated professional development required by law uh, for, for regulation. I think we desperately need to sit down with our staff and talk about what kind of mentoring they need coming into the district. And I think the easiest way to do that is talk to people who are just finishing their first year to say, okay, what, what worked and what didn't work, and go from there. Uh, because mentoring is, is not evaluating. Mentoring is helping somebody survive the jungle of education, which it really is. It's, it, there's a lot of pitfalls out there in education in your first year. Uh, and some people need two years of mentoring. So right now we cut it off at a year, but I, I do believe there are certain certain people that just need extra help even in their second year. And I have no problem with that. We just need to sit down and really formalize it. So as we go forward, we will formalize and finalize a new mentoring plan 
for all new staff members, and we'll put it in writing for implementation. I just think you owe it, we owe it, we invest a lot of money in people. Uh, it's an 80, you know, 75% of our budget is in people. I think it's just really, really important that we understand that we have to develop people, make them better at what they do. Uh, if, we're, if we're gonna do that, mentoring is one piece of that. The evaluation piece is obviously another piece. Uh, the daily observation is another piece. Uh, but the mentoring is where it starts because that's how you find the faculty room. That's how you know who to go to if you have a problem. That's how you know where to find a paper, where to get things copied. It's just going to take a lot of work, uh, and, and it takes dedication on the part of your veteran employees to do that. Uh, the principals have been engaged in uh, a lot of collaborative work with other principals and other administrators in other districts. They've been doing this through the Achievement Network, uh, through principal meetings and with, with other high school principals, through the NISL training that our middle school principal and elementary principal have been going through this year. Uh, the NISL training is a long, is, is a long range, three year kind of training plan. Uh, there's a lot of training that goes into making people good instructional leaders. The NISL is really about making people good instructional leaders as principals. Uh, the Achievement Network is much more focused on data inquiry and how to use your data teams to drive instruction in a positive way. So it's, but the most important part of that is the networking and the sharing of ideas and best practices from principal to principal from districts and schools that are in like circumstances. So we're in a consortium with a lot of schools in, in Holyoke and, and Springfield, so other districts that are uh, in level four status but also have some of the similarities and have some, seen some success. Uh, and we, I think, can show them some things as well that work for us that may not, uh, they may not be trying right now. So it's, a, it's good to get our administrators out there on the forefront of things. Uh, this, the NISL stands for the National Institute of School Leadership. We've had two principals go through that all this past school year. It is a multi-year program. It is paid for through Race to the Top. We'll continue that next year. Go into goal two, and it's not nearly as long as goal one. They get shorter as we go. Uh, School-based support teams have been put into place. We've had a formal training by a, uh, uh, a doctor of psychology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Uh, this year, we'll do more training as we go forward with our other school teams uh, and get the school-based support teams up and running in all of our buildings. Uh, and they really focus on student achievement and data. Uh, they also focus on, uh, should be focusing on some school-wide issues uh, and appropriate interventions uh, for, stu for students and for groups of students. Uh, they've been doing some of that this year, but next year they will just take it to the next level. Uh, and continue to, to provide uh, recommendations to the building administrative teams on uh, uh, how to improve the buildings. <coughs> this will become increasingly important as we change configuration as a district. The school-wide issues are an area that we haven't gotten a lot into, but we'll do more and more of uh, when we transition to the new buildings. Uh, we also uh, will use uh, the school-based support teams uh, to study some operational questions and to look at some discipline and attendance data, as well as any kind of uh, uh, student surveys or parent surveys or staff surveys that we do. That's the kind of data and information that the school-based support team will analyze and then create recommendations for the building administration uh, that may be able to be implemented to improve uh, student achievement and morale. Uh, this is an area I think we're weak in. It's transitioning students from one grade level to the next. It all changes next year when we go to the new configuration. Uh, so as we go through next year, we'll be developing a full transition plans, uh, put in writing, and uh, it'll be uh, a series of multiple, multiple series of, of transitional activities for grades kindergarten, first grade, second grade, sixth grade, ninth grade, and 12th grade. Uh, that 12th grade is one that you hardly ever see, but it's one I never leave out because you gotta remember we're sending 100 some odd students out into the real world, either college or the world of work or some kind of training. We need to have some kind of a plan for them and a safety net for them if they go out there and they need some help. So that transitional activities and getting them out there with the, in the general public uh, to understand what's expected of them as young adults is, is extremely important to me. Uh, so we'll be working on those transition plans and putting those in writing. Uh, next year is a perfect year to do it because we will be in our new buildings and we'll see where uh, the pitfalls might be. Uh, 
this data transfer, uh, Julie Fields again, our data manager, has integrated the student's record into the iPass system. She's still working on this, it's a work in progress. Uh, but we are getting more and more detailed kinds of reports out of the iPass system, and we anticipate that we're going to get much better at this as time goes forward. Uh, so we are, as we do these new assessments, we're going to be taking spreadsheets, putting them into the database, and every teacher, uh, if, you get a, if you're a classroom teacher and you get a group of sixth graders in front of you, you're going to be able to look a sixth grader up in your class and see all their assessment data from the time they entered our school system all the way up to the present time. So you'll get a really good picture of where they're strong and where they're weak before school year starts or at least right at the beginning of the school year. So you get a good handle on how to drive your instruction in that first few weeks to identify the students in your build, in your, in your classroom that are struggling or why they struggle or if they've had a history of struggling. If it's a new thing, then that's also tells us something. So our, our teachers need to have access to this data and it's just now becoming a reality for us and, and it's still not where we want it to be, but it's, it's getting there. We've implemented the anti-bullying and harassment plan. Uh, we have done a pretty good job within our staff and within our uh, <coughs> students. I think we've not done a good enough job with our parents, and I think we need to do a little better job with our staff about their responsibilities in responding to bullying and harassment. So we will continue the practice that we have now of training our staff, and we'll have to do a better job of notifying our parents uh, through a number of different media sources, uh, and I'll work with our trainer on that. Uh, it's come up as an issue at the state level uh, a couple of times, and, and uh, we sort of stuck with our guns this year, uh, but I think we need a little better job of notifying our parents about what the expectations are in terms of bullying and harassment. The Peace Builders program, as you know, is a, is a, a, a going gang, gangbusters in all of our buildings, uh, and we'll continue as we go through, uh, throughout the district. Uh, we're also going to be implementing something called the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports Program. It dovetails very nicely. It takes, it takes the Peace Builders Program and builds upon it. It proactively teaches students appropriate behavior in different settings. Uh, it also rewards students and recognizes students for appropriate behavior. It's a positive PBIS. It's a positive behavior intervention and support. It's about teaching students proactively how to act and then rewarding them or recognizing them when they act appropriately and trying to be positive when you deal with an issue. So if you see a student who's not conforming to the regulations of the rules, then the idea is how you approach them is in a positive way. Not in, don't do that, but in, this is what we'd like to see you do. Something in a more positive vein, instead of being negative and pound the kid, you know, really talk to the kid and teach the student, be a teacher for a minute, and teach the student what the expectation is. I know it's difficult to do, especially if you're angry at a student, which we do get sometimes. But that's what the PBIS program is designed to do. Uh, it is a program that is, is uh, proven over the last 15 to 20 years to be extremely effective in reducing the number of students' suspensions, increasing attendance, reducing disciplines in general, uh, and increasing academic achievement because the attendance gets better, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, it is a program that the special ed department wrote a grant for to do the training for our team. So we'll have our teacher teams trained in the fall through a grant, it won't cost us anything. It'll also help us build the character education program. We haven't done anything with that this year, but as we go into the Peace Builders and the PBIS program together, it really becomes the nice basis for a good character education program that we will develop as we go through the next school year. Uh, we did the bullying prevention training this year uh, in the intervention and the harassment training. Uh, we will repeat this in the fall. Uh, we will continue to do this mandated training, uh, but again, like I said earlier, the, the notification issues and the, the communication with the parents has to get a little bit better. Uh, one of the things that, that I believe in when you're dealing with students in poverty and students of different cultures, a diverse student population, it's extremely important that you train your staff on how to deal with some of the issues that are unique to those populations. We have not done anything this year, but as we go through the next year, we'll be identifying uh, things that, that we believe our staff may need training on. Uh, we'll be identifying, uh, quite frankly, good trainers. Uh, there are some good ones out there. There's a lady by the name of Ruby Payne that does a lot of training on high poverty districts. And uh, when, unfortunately, I can tell you we can't afford Ruby Payne. Uh, it's very, very expensive. But there are a lot of people who can train with that philosophy in mind. Because dealing with students in poverty is extremely 
unique in how you have to understand their, their reaction and their interactions with each other and, and, and uh, people in authority. Uh, so we will do, plan that training very carefully and then implement it in 2013 and 14. We also plan on introducing and adopting the National Guidance Curriculum Standards. Uh, this will be the, one of the jobs of the new PPS director. Uh, we have not done anything with it to this point. Uh, I have mentioned it to a couple of our guidance counselors who, who are somewhat familiar with the standards but have, are not implementing the standards at this point. Uh, so over the next year we will be talking to our staff, uh, the, the first six months of the year, talking to our staff about the new guidance uh, uh, the standards and, and trying to implement the, the guidance curriculum uh, and the uh, guidance standards uh, in uh, January 2013. Uh, Mass Corps is another area very similar. We are much more familiar with this at the high school level. Uh, I was talking to Mr. Bishop about this today. Uh, we have uh, more students this year uh, who will graduate, who graduate with Mass Corps requirements. Mass Corps is just a set of requirements for graduation that gets kids ready for college. We already have, have more students signed up next year to meet the Mass Corps standards than we had graduate this year with the Mass Corps standards. So we know we're, we're consciously scheduling students into classes that will allow them to achieve the Mass Corps standards. Uh, we just need to do a better job of making our guidance and our administration team a little more aware of what those Mass Corps standards are, and our students, quite frankly, and then through them, our parents. This is a Race to the Top initiative. It's called Your Plan for College, Get Ready for Life After High School. It's about getting college, kids college and career ready. Um, another, another initiative that goes along with the guidance standards uh, for the director of PPS to work on. Uh, this is uh, paid for through Race to the Top, but uh, we have not sent anybody to training yet on it. Uh, so we'll do that this coming fall. Go into goal three which has decreased the dropout rate and increased high school graduation. By the way, our high school graduation rate uh, tentatively right now for this past grade uh, class is higher than it's ever been. Uh, so it's a good, good sign. I don't have the number yet, but just a preliminary number looks pretty good. Uh, so we'll give you those numbers when they become uh, official. We're not really allowed to give you specific numbers at this point with some of that stuff. Uh, Profiling at-risk students is a dangerous task uh, because you don't want to, to label a student as at-risk, but we all know what the characteristics of at-risk students are based on their, student, their performance in classes, but also their performance on assessment, their attendance, their discipline records, those kind of things. Uh, so over the next year, uh, our building leadership teams will be tasked with the responsibility to create an at-risk profile of students and also then to act on that profile by getting students that, that kind of fall into those categories the proper supports and interventions so that they don't become at risk or that they don't continue down that path of being at risk to graduate on time. Ideally, uh, what we're doing is we're identifying students and providing them support and interventions immediately. And that's really be done through the school-based support teams once that profile and the students is, is created and the, and the students are uh, are uh, identified, then the school-based support team will continue to monitor their progress. Extended learning time, I know sometimes is a bad term around here because I know you had a grant at one time. I thought what I'm talking about. One of the things, there are really only three kinds of interventions. Uh, one is extended time, more time. Uh, one is, is uh, smaller groups, one-on-one -on -one to one-on-two to one-on-five, those kind of things. And the third one is some kind of an ironclad intervention program. We are trying to implement all three. The ironclad intervention program is that continuum of interventions that I was talking about. Research-based things that work, have proven to work in other environments and will work with our students. Uh, we know that we can do small group. We do that now with our integrated service model. Small group all over the place. You'll see classrooms of 25 kids and all of a sudden then you'll see six groups of four and they'll be working together. So you see smaller group, that's working, that's, that's an intervention. The last one, that, that, that extended time, is, is one that uh, we struggle with because it costs money, uh, and we really don't want to pull students, and I have no idea what's happening in this thing at this point. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't want students pulled out of their regular classroom instruction, so we have to look for creative ways to extend that learning time for students. We've been doing that through the integrated service model, giving kids more time, 
uh, with certain materials that they're struggling with. I think we can do it both before school, after school, during lunch. I think we can do a lot of creative things if we can, can pursue some grants. Uh, so we'll pursue some grant opportunities uh, and we'll get creative with how to present, uh, uh, pre how to extend that learning time. I think it's really important to understand that as we go into the next school year, we're creating a new district. An early childhood center, two one through five buildings, a brand new six through 12 building. And so we have a perfect opportunity to get creative and not fall back into patterns that haven't worked. And I think it's, it's really important for us to, to go into this with sort of a fresh approach and look for extended learning times within the context of what we already have. I think the people out there are pretty creative in our district. The teachers and the administrators are pretty creative about how they can get some of these things done. Becoming more aware of uh, the uh, uh, colleges and the four-year opportunities, the post-secondary opportunities for students, we've extended that down to grades four through 12. Uh, we, you can see that we've done some things with Upward Bound, we've done some things with Aspira, we've done some things with some local companies. The bad news of the night, and I think this is the worst news of the night, is the Upward Bound program will no longer be in existence. It has lost its grant funding. So uh, they're getting creative, and we're getting creative, and we're working with Quinn Sigamon College very closely. I signed a grant uh, for them today uh, where they will, they will actually if they get this grant, they'll work with our high school students to get them onto campus to do not only some intervention, MCAS intervention, to get those kids through those tests, but also to make them aware of what's available in the post-secondary world. And then we'll continue to do things with Nichols College and the College of Worcester Consortium and, and a lot of uh, different opportunities for our kids. We want to get much more active because Upward Bound took care of us in some ways with, with that grant. Uh, but I think if we are smart about how we do it and we really focus, we can probably access even more because we won't be bound by Dustin Nichols College, which is where the Upper Bound program was. We'll be able to expand it to the entire colleges of Worcester Consortium and maybe even some other outlying schools. Uh, we'll train our guidance staff in the Career Passport Program. I doubt that there's anybody in this room and maybe nobody in town that knows what the Career Passport Program is. Uh, a career passport program, uh, we haven't done a lot with it this year, uh, but we've been, I've been developing a plan. I'll say a plan is being developed. I, I can tell you I'm doing it because I created this program in, in a building I was a high school principal in. And what it does is it takes students away from a traditional diploma. They, they will get the diploma, don't worry. They'll have the same diploma they get now. But what they also will come out of school with is a passport. They'll come out of school with letters of recommendation from their teachers or employers that they've worked for over, this, over their career. They'll come out with uh, some job skills that we've been able to assess and give them some sort of a certificates for. If they participate in community service, that'll be documented in there. It'll come as a portfolio. And if, we, if and when we are able to implement this, the student, when they walk across straight, stage, will get not only their diploma in a, in a portfolio, but they'll get all this other documentation so they can take it right to an employer or right to a college and say, this is what I am, this is what I've done. It, it is truly a career passport. Uh, it, it takes the responsibility back to the students for documenting their resume, they have to start creating a resume in classes from freshman year up, and it changes every year. The more they take, the more they do. It makes them much more aware of the impact of what they do when they become freshmen and what they do when they're sophomores. As they matriculate through school, they see a connection between the beginning of the, the, their school years in ninth grade all the way through graduation. So they're going to walk out with something very elaborate. Uh, but it is not a traditional diploma uh, kind of ceremony. It, it becomes a career passport ceremony. Uh, we are working on a number of different initiatives and have worked all year with, uh, with Quinn Sigamon College. We have a good, very good relationship with their vice president for development and the person, uh, uh, Victor who, uh, Soma, who runs the, uh, the local branch of Quinn Sigamon Community College. Uh, they will... Uh, you know, we're talking to them about you know, having some programs in our old building. Uh, we're talking to them about tutoring some of our high school students. We're talking to them about uh, some joint partnerships between Quinn Sigamon College and, a, and an early childhood education program that they ha house with the Worcester County Community Action, Head Start, and getting our, 
our facilities and our students involved with their students and, and the, the early childhood students all in a cooperative uh, way to, to get education happening in Southbridge in a united, in a united way, uh, which I think is really exciting. And, and uh, again, I signed a, uh, a grant for them today, which I think has some real possibilities. Currently, we're using class.com for credit recovery. I'm not happy with class.com. Uh, I think it's expensive, and I think it, uh, it works for some kids, but probably isn't as extensive as we need to go. I'm not meaning we'll go away from it. We just need to look at, at improving it and expanding it. So we're going to look at uh, a comprehensive 6 through 12 credit recovery program. Most people don't do credit recovery for middle school students. They just let them fail and to put them back in the same classes. I think it's important to understand that we're going into a 6 through 12 building, 7 years, and I don't want it to be 9 for some kids. I want it to be 7, which means we have to have a credit recovery program for every child coming into the 6th grade who's not successful. If they fail, we need to have some safety net in place to get that student to proficiency so that they're ready to go to 7th grade on time. We have to do that. This has been part of our plan all along. We've done a lot of it. I'm not saying we haven't done some of it. I'm saying we just need to really get it better. Uh, there are a lot of traditional and non-traditional approaches we can use. And I think as we had a, get a true group of people working on this, we are, I mean, uh, multiple minds obviously are always better than one. But we need a comprehensive program. And we need to start thinking of credit recovery as a middle school and high school problem, not just a high school problem. The, uh, Again, alternative settings, not, not unsimilar to what we just talked about with credit recovery. It's a little more in-depth because when you talk about twilight school and, and, and uh, night school programs and things, you're actually talking about programs for kids who have, are significantly behind or maybe have even dropped out of school already. This is designed to talk to about kidding kids who are not going to be successful in a traditional setting into a different setting, possibly at the old high school, but it has to be done with grant funds or within our, our, our budget now. Uh, but I've seen Twilight School, for example, I started the first one in the state of Ohio as a high school principal, and, and we graduated 50 kids over about a three-year period who had already dropped out of high school but came back because they didn't have to go to school with all the other kids. A lot of times when a kid drops out of school, they become 17, 18 years old. They don't want to be in class with a 14-year-old, so they just drop out. It's easier. They don't get laughed at. They don't get made fun of. You create a different environment, a different setting, and they'll come back to school where they're not going to be judged and questioned, but where they can focus and actually get, get a high school diploma. Uh, that, that approach is something that uh, I think will work in Southbridge, and, and uh, uh, so we need to look at that. So as we go forward, uh, we'll use the credit recovery program uh, and the alternative approach is similar as, as we go through that, that discussion. Finally, the last, uh, the last goal uh, would be to, to improve our public perception. I hope that tonight people can see that we're actually not sitting on our hands, we're doing a lot of work, a lot of hard work, or a lot of good work. Uh, the School Choice Task Force has never taken off uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which we've just been bogged down with a whole lot of other things with, with building a new building and getting the reconfiguration done. However, I have spent some time uh, talking to a number, up, upwards of 20 to 25 parents who have sent their children out School Choice. Factors that have come up more often than not are the lack of rigor in our classrooms, the behavior of other students. I have heard things like, I don't want my, my, my kid to go to school with those kids. Uh, and I think when I, when I really delve into that question with those people, it was really about behavior. So it's about getting, getting students into a better frame of mind and going to school and, 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 and that character education piece, be, behaving the way we expect them to behave. Uh, but it does come down sometimes to particularly students of color. I've heard that right from people in town. Uh, of job proximity, is one you don't think of very often, but some people don't make a choice to leave us and go to school choice for any reason other than it's close to where they work. They drive by a school on the way to work, they drop their kid off, they pick them up on the way home. It's as simple as convenient sometimes. And the other one I think that we hear is, is sometimes there are programs we just don't offer. Uh, so obviously there's some things we can't do, you know, we're not going to have an ice hockey team, especially tonight. Uh, it's a little warm in here, but, you know, we're just not going to be able to support some of those things. So, uh, you know, we're going to lose some kids to those kind of issues. But those are the ones I heard the most. But, again, it's not a scientific survey. But as we go forward, 
uh, we, have, uh, we have started to develop a survey using a, something called SurveyMonkey, which will allow us to survey those parents and all of our parents, quite frankly, on uh, things that we may not do, be doing well uh, and things that we can make better because you know, we're in an improvement situation. We need to listen and respond. Uh, so we'll, we'll actually uh, conduct that survey, I think, on, online and see what kind of response we get and then follow up with phone calls and face-to-face and -face interviews. Uh, we've expanded the ELL, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, the, the role of parent liaisons, and that's really designed to help us communicate with parents uh, using their native language or just somebody who's not as threatening, quite frankly, as an administrator. Sometimes a building principal or superintendent can be uh, threatening to people. Uh, our parent liaisons are, are parents from the community, people from the community who uh, who are able to go into the homes, are able to make phone calls, meet with people face to face, and get them to talking about what their issues are. We've expanded this. Uh, we will have full-time apparent liaisons next year at uh, both of our one through five buildings. And we'll also have parent liaison at the new middle high school. That's a new position that we put in the budget this year. Uh, we also have parent advisory teams that will become much more active uh, next year. That goes back to the parent liaison piece. Uh, we've put them in place for next year. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I want to do a better job of is keeping a communications log. So I, wanna, I want administrators, particularly administrators, teachers, and these parent liaisons to log their communications. I want to know who they're talking to. I don't want to know necessarily what it's all about. I want to know numbers, just pure data. How many people did we talk to this year? How many people did we talk to this month? And you know, how many were positive? Did we call somebody and say, you know what, Mrs. Woodruff, your child did a great job today. You know, how many, how many of those kind of conversations are we having versus Mrs. Woodruff, your kid's a bum, they didn't do well, something screwed up. You know, we do a lot of negative phone calls and I want to get away from that. I want to get to a much more positive and I want to communicate those, uh, the importance of keeping a record of who you talk to. And I need to get better at it. I think all the administrators will get better at it. And our teachers need to get better at it. And our parent liaisons will have to do it. Because we're going to want to keep some baseline data on what, how many people we're talking to and, and why as we go forward. Uh, the Community Advisory Council has been identified. The people, many people have volunteered for this. Uh, so, so we will, uh, you know, we have used parents already to do the, uh, uh, neighborhood schools a model as you know as you know we have a lot of peer people involved with that uh, but we'll have community advisory council meetings uh, and that will really be about me meeting with this group of people to talk about you know ways to improve the school district not only ways to to improve it from a systemic standpoint but a way to improve the public perception of the school district what can we do to make ourselves more appealing to our community I will also be meeting regularly, uh, uh, hopefully quarterly, with uh, any, sort of have an open forum for the clergy and for members of community agencies uh, to come in, meet with me for lunch, and just have a discussion about how their agencies or how these churches and, and the different organizations can work together uh, to help the students and the families in Southbridge. That will happen quarterly throughout next year a lot of people who are interested in this, uh, so we just need to open it up and, and, and start um, scheduling those and having uh, the, the, the way to do it, the format to do it. Uh, the partnerships with Quinsigamond College we've talked about. Uh, I've made contact with Southridge Conference Center to hold a summit uh, of the educational leaders in the area. Uh, so we're targeting October, November, depending on when we can schedule in there to talk about what the educational system in the town of Southbridge looks like. Uh, we will develop community surveys, again using SurveyMonkey. Uh, it's part of our uh, accelerated improvement plan. Uh, we'll conduct those in the fall of 2012, and then we would uh, really target giving the school committee some sort of, a, of feedback in the beginning of, of March. And then we would do that every year and a half to two years. You don't want to run that kind of survey every year. Uh, traditionally, you run it every two to three years, but I think we need to probably run it a little more often. Uh, keeping parents and community involved in discussion of district reconfiguration, we did that, and I think I 
maybe put that in the wrong place back there, but we, we had a, about eight months, uh, Mr. Uh, DiGregorio and I and a couple other school committee members and a lot of parents and staff members spent about eight months studying that reconfiguration. It's probably one of the most effective processes that I've seen in that kind of situation. We took a situation that could have you know, easily been explosive and, and made it palatable for the entire community. Uh, so with the new, new configuration is in place and ready to go. Uh, uh, to, from my knowledge, I believe almost every student has already been placed in the classroom with the teacher they're going to have next year. Uh, establishing business partnerships. Uh, currently, we know that we have a, 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 a Charlton Street has a partnership with Shot International. Eastford Road has partnerships with Hyde Tools, and I think I left one out. Uh, yeah, the anonymous one. I'm not allowed to say that one. Uh, and West Street, I know, is open discussions with a bank, a local bank, uh, to have a partnership. And I think the missing link here is a partnership with a middle high school uh, with a local business. And, and, I, and I would, quite frankly, target uh, having a partnership with Harrington Hospital if we can work it out. It just seems to be a natural fit for us. We also have partnerships with Quinn Sigamund. And, but I'm looking at local businesses and trying to form a partnership with, with uh, a meaningful partnership for our secondary students with with uh, the medical community because they think that that is a big employer, it's the biggest employer in town and, and it's also, uh, they can provide us, a lot of our parents work there, they can provide us with the, uh, the feedback that our students need to be successful as they go forward. Uh, communications plan, uh, we have a new television studio in, the, in the, new, uh, the new building. We have a lot of technology available to us. Uh, we have a broadcast journalism program going into place at the new middle high school. Uh, so we have now the capability, we have a high-speed copy room in the new middle high school. So as we go forward, we just need to do a really better job of communicating through the different media that we have available to us, especially with the new technology that we have coming available. Uh, our new district website, uh, Julie Fields, I know, has been developing this new website uh, in shadows all year. Uh, it's been running, uh, it's been hosted by Fusion and we've been developing this website to be rolled out and our old website taken down all over one night. So we haven't decided when we're gonna do that, but our new website has been in development as we go. A lot of things will transfer over, but there's a lot of new things. For example, you no longer have a Southbridge High School, you have a Southbridge Middle High School. So you have two different buildings going side by side in the same building, but the way it's presented, obviously, will be a united front, and that's the way we've been presenting it all along. Two, one through five buildings instead of a two, three, and a four, five. So there's a lot of new things that are happening, and we just need to get that out there onto our website. But we're not ready to roll it out yet, but uh, over the next month or so, we'll, we'll roll out a brand new website. Uh, as you know, I, I don't have to go onto this one too much. We're very involved in the community, very involved in community activities, parades, uh, festivals, those kind of things. We'll continue to do that and obviously try to get uh, those things on an ongoing basis doing more and more. Keeping the community involved uh, about the new building program, uh, I'll keep you involved. Uh, we, there's furniture in the classrooms. Uh, the furniture, as I've heard today, is, is uh, going in hot and heavy. Uh, almost every classroom has furniture in it. Uh, the, there's no teacher desks yet, but they'll come along later. They're coming along in the next few weeks, next week or so. Uh, technology starting to arrive into the new building. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we have been, we did a tour of the building last week, and it's in, just in a week from the last time I went, it was dramatically improved. And uh, they're backing their way out the front door. The kitchen area is, uh, they're putting the, the equipment in now. Is that right, Mr. Lazo? They're putting the equipment in now, yep. uh, the, the, all the, uh, the, the stoves and those kind of things. So uh, it's coming along very, very well. Uh, it certainly will be a beautiful site. If you go into that building and walk around when you get a chance, just look at some of the views. It's, it's uh, you know, you probably couldn't pay for that view in a lot of places. It's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful site. Uh, the grand opening for the middle high school will be scheduled for the third, probably the third or fourth week of September, probably sometime in the third week of September. Uh, we're not going to have the grand opening on the first day of school. You never mess with the first day of school. Uh, but we'll plan something and invite the community to that. Uh, the PTO has approached me about uh, having open houses in the new buildings. 
Uh, and so we welcome that. Uh, they'll be communicating, working through the building principles to open, have open houses and host open houses for parents and students, uh, especially in these new, new buildings, that, uh, the one through five buildings in the new middle high school, hopefully. And the principals will also be running those things. Uh, we're, we have a resource accountability plan in full force. Uh, we have done a uh, budget analysis, zero-based budget analysis and budget development. We have uh, uh, done regular inventory uh, controls. We have uh, now inventories into place and we'll keep those up to date as we go forward. Uh, the technology department is, has done an inventory. We'll continue to do the inventory and, and know exactly what we have and where it is all the time. And uh, I have now set a date for Mr. Wigan and his team to create our five-year technology plan and software plan. And I was very magnanimous. I gave them until February 1st. Uh, I know they've been thinking about doing this, and it's been kind of hectic. So hopefully it's come uh, later in the summer, early fall, they can start working on creating a real five-year plan for our district in terms of technology. Uh, we need to do a program evaluation. We haven't done it uh, thoroughly. Uh, we'll work with some outside agencies on this. Uh, it has been being done as a side effect of doing the alignment to the Massachusetts frameworks for ELA and math. So we've been evaluating our ELA and math programs as we go, but we just need to get some kind of template in place. So we'll be working with some outside uh, uh, consultants on this because this is a process that really requires some research and, and uh, a process that we're not, uh, quite frankly, I don't think we have the capacity to do it right now. Uh, we are trying to update our email addresses for our parents. So any parents out there, if you have an email address, please give it to the building principal. We'll try to get it in, put it into our system. That way we can do email blast on any kind of news or anything that happens. For example, if we have uh, another mercury spill at one of our buildings, we'll be able to get an email out to parents right away to let you know what's happening. So it's one way for us to communicate to all of our parents. Uh, and, and it can be done through our iPass system pretty easily. We have a number of those already on file, but uh, we just need to update those and get as many as possible. So we need to be a little more aggressive, and doing that, we'll do it at registration for students and those sorts of things, and try to really gather as much information as we can. Uh, this is the communications log I was talking about, uh, and basically the, the log should document who, when, and why, uh, who we talk to, when we talk to them, and why we talk to them. And that completes 147 slides. A lot of work. Uh, I will say this, I, I appreciate my administrative staff. Thank you. I, I appreciate the administrative staff and the teaching staff because this stuff doesn't happen without a lot of work from a lot of people. Uh, so I, I would take any questions that the school committee may have come up with along the way. Or you just want to absorb it and then come take it up at a later meeting. It's about 9,000 degrees where I'm standing. Any question? No. Mm -hmm. Just a yeah. quick question. Yeah. What year does this uh, strategic plan cover from the The, the, the strategic plan is traditionally a three to five year plan. We have done uh, about 80% of the plan in the first two years. So I would say we're, we're on target, but it, as you can see, the reason I put the green slides in there, the what we do next is sort of, because any, any strategic plan is a, a dynamic document, so it's kind of rolling and going forward. We've done a lot, we're gonna do more. And, and then if we need to focus a little more on some data that we don't yet, uh, don't yet have in this, I, I think we, we will be able to give you data uh, that supports all the things we're talking about. There was data that led to all these things. Uh, the problem is most of the data for the current year is embargoed. And I wanted to give a five-year history of the data, which we'll do at a later date, but it would have added another 45 minutes to this probably tonight. So at a future meeting, you'll have updated as to yes. the data to support them. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have anything else further under your report of the superintendent? I'm done. Okay. Just as a, a matter of under your report, earlier you had said that uh, Jeff Zangi was leaving the district and Jeff's here tonight. Jeff, I just want to thank you for your uh, work that you did here in the district. Uh, you've been here a number of years and uh, you brought a lot of great uh, 
vision and work to the curriculum department. I thank you for that, and I wish you the best of luck. Sad to see you go. I think uh, our loss is certainly Tantasqua's gain. I'm not happy that you're going to Tantasqua, but, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but I wish you the best of luck, honestly. I wish you the best of luck. I wish you weren't leaving, but uh, thank you for everything you did here in the district. Thank you. Moving on, agenda item 10, report of the business manager, Mr. Wigner. I have no slides in my presentation and no report. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> school committee actions. Uh, a, move that the Suffolk School Committee approve the changes in the central office staff base salaries and titles as proposed by the school business manager. Is there a motion? Is there a motion? So move for the point of discussion. Thank you. Is there a second for that? Second. Thank you. Discussion? Mr. Lazo? I, I'd just like to comment. Uh, this, this is an issue that's not new to us, uh, the reconfigurations, and we've worked on them a lot. Uh, I'm going on my third business manager and my third superintendent on renaming the front office positions, reconfiguring the duties, and salary adjustments. And um, I'm just... I think the taxpayers need a break on this one. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're really working on a, a, a budget where we have many other things, uh, maybe a science teacher or a mathematics teacher, uh, additions to the curriculum uh, sector as far as you know teachers. So I know that we've replaced a lot, and I think this, this past budget was fine. But I think, uh, as far as my personal opinion, I think we've adjusted um, these many times upward. And I think that uh, at some point, um, you know, we've adjusted them to be competitive, and uh, I think they're fine where they are. I mean, with uh, all due respect, I think it's time to uh, to put the brakes on the economy. Stuff. Thank you, okay. Mrs. Woodruff. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we did not have a full committee the last meeting to discuss this and, and vote on it. We still don't have a full committee, and, and I'd like to make a, a postponement again to the next meeting in July so that all of the members can be present at this time. It's a very important um, thing that we need to um, do, and it's something that really does need to be done, but I think everyone should be present at that time. Thank okay. you. A motion to postpone to the next meeting? Yes, please. Is the there July a second meeting? to that? Second. Motion to postpone. Okay. Motion was uh, moved and seconded. Roll call. Mr. DiGiorgio? Yes. Mr. Gomez? Yes. Mr. Lago? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Okay, motion to postpone to the next meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Roger. Thank you. On our unfinished business, uh, District reconfiguration, I think you pretty much touched on everything. I think we're all set there. Any, qu any questions from members on district reconfiguration before we pass? All right, seeing none. Ad Cart Committee on the Maintenance Department and updates. Um, just a quick update. Um, we did tour um, with Joe uh, DeGillis from the uh, Southern Worcester County, uh, excuse me, the Worcester Committee Action Council. Uh, we toured the old high school and um, with Mr. Wiggins and uh, I know uh, Mr. ely has been directly involved in all of this also, and what we did was we toured, and they're in very interested. They're housed in Pleasant Street School. These are our kids, uh, and we've worked uh, as, as far as looking at uh, classroom space and office space. Uh, it's part of the um, filling of the old school. Um, I know the television station was interested in the band area. I know Mr. Ely's working on collaborative uh, on, on another portion of the building. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot going on with administration possibly moving up there. We think that's going up there. So um, it, was, it was exciting because I think it's an opportunity. It's just that I think that uh, we all know that it's a negotiations, uh, a numbers um, game as far as is it palatable for both parties to come to an agreement. But again, I think first and foremost, our kids uh, being in Southbridge, staying in Southbridge, uh, it's, it's very important. So I just want to report progress. Thank you. So ready to approve the plan. I think we're all set on it. I think we're, we're all set. We're submitting some final benchmarks. And we have, an, believe it or not, we have our second year of that plan due July 13th. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we'll get a further report next time meeting. I hope so. Okay. Anybody else have any unfinished business? Mr. Uh, DeGregor? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Couple, just a couple things. First thing is I got stopped outside Big Bunny the other day 
by some lady who was upset that we were paying, and, and these are in her words, kids uh, of the school committee $15 an hour to move stuff around. And I told her I didn't know what she was talking about other than the fact that $15 an hour is what we felt was a fair going rate to do this type of work. For, I don't care if you're a kid or if you're a, a you know, uh, an older person who was doing this and it was not your regular profession because quite honestly, if it was your regular profession, you would be making between 25, at least as far as my experience goes, 25 to $35 an hour. Uh, I have no idea about the second part of her, uh, I'm not gonna say it was an accusation, it was just simply a statement uh, of people that, you know, working or that or have parents on the school committee that they're doing this. Uh, I have no idea about what's going on there. It really is, you know, I, I'm paying whoever is doing the moving to do the moving. But I just thought I would bring that forward for you guys. Secondly, I finally just want to say that there was a quote in the paper the other day that stated that they felt my heart wasn't in this school committee for the past couple of years. Well, don't confuse frustration and confusion with boredom. Uh, education is tough, and the process is maddeningly slow, but the rewards are fantastic. So I enjoyed the ride, and thank you very much, Southbridge. Yeah, let, let, me, Mr. Res Mr. Let, me, yeah, let me respond to, to, the, to the lady uh, from, from Big Bunny and to uh, anybody else who's concerned. Uh, the process of hiring, it follows a process in our district. We, we post positions, we take applications, we interview, and we select. That's done uh, at many different levels. Ultimately, they're all my responsibility. Uh, so I take full responsibility for the, for the young people that we've hired. We've hired uh, students who have graduated recently. We've hired students who have graduated from other school districts. We've hired adults. We've hired uh, college students, and, and I, uh, I will stand behind each and every one of them and the team that did the interview process and selected those candidates. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mr. Jovan, uh, Mr. Ely, do you know you an approximate of uh, how, how many young people we hired for this uh, move? I think 14 or 15. I believe, I believe it was 15. And we had about 60 applicants. Could you just clarify, too, who set the rate? It was not the school committee? Because I've heard that out there. No, the well. rate was set by uh, the business manager and his team, his, his, his team of maintenance folks with my input. Uh, they brought it to me. I approved it. Thank you. Any, Mrs. Woodruff? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I just want to take um, this time now to thank Mr. DiGregorio for putting all his years of service into the school committee, and it's been a pleasure um, working with you. I've been on it the last seven years, and I believe you've been on it about nine. And uh, Mrs. Principe also asked me to let you know that um, she appreciates all your years of service and will miss looking at you from afar down this end. And uh, we all know that we'll still be seeing you around, so it's not a goodbye, but it, we just wanted to thank you for all your years. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Just a quick comment uh, to, to Mr. DiGregorio's service. Um, I don't usually believe everything I read in the papers, but when Dave DiGregorio says his heart's not in it, I don't believe it. Um, he's a guy that I grew up with, spent a good many years playing ball with, and he was a guy that always put his heart into everything he did. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, your service was always respected and, and, and honored in my book. We've disagreed. We've had some good floor battles, which I think that uh, comes from my head coach. We just don't know when to quit. Um, but I think uh, you're a quality guy, a stand-up member. We're not going to always agree, but I just want to thank you for all years of service. And I know for a fact that your heart is always into everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Now, just echo that. Uh, Mr. Gregorio, I, you know, we've had the pleasure of serving on the school committee for nine years together. and. Uh, We've certainly been through a lot together. And I think uh, if anybody was to look back on our service during that period of time, there's a lot more good than bad. Uh, sometimes it's hard as we sit up here in the trenches every day to realize 
the change and effect that we have on the district. And I think, well, I don't think, I, I use that term sometimes, I don't think, but I, I do know that this district is a stronger district today than it was nine years ago when we first started out on this quest. The quest isn't done yet. Um, I wish you the best of luck you. Uh, in your Thank future you. endeavors, and I've always respected your opinion. Um, again, we don't always agree to disagree. We don't always <laughs> agree, but we have agreed to disagree. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I truly believe that whatever decisions we've made, we've always made with the best intentions of our heart for what's best for kids in this district. Uh, we've all had kids that have graduated from this district or have kids there. Um, it's always been from the heart. And thank you for your service, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you very, very much. Okay. All right. Uh, new business. We had a regularly scheduled school committee meeting for July 3rd, 2012, in council chambers, but uh, I think that date may need to be changed. Yeah, isn't it? it does. Uh, I, thought it would, I thought it was on the second. Ty actually. Typically, the, the second next week. meeting is the second Tuesday of the right. month, so I'm not sure how this date was selected. I'm not sure either, but, but if, if that would be the 10th. The 10th? The 10th. So, the 10th. The 10th. Is that okay? That's good. The 10th. That's typically when it's held, is the second Tuesday anyway, so that would be the 10th. Unanimous on that? I'm okay. Okay. I'm okay. okay. No, with that. All right. <laughs> Any further new business? <clears throat> Mr. Lazo. I just like a quick moment, Mr. Chairman, um, in listening to all the positive things that the town manager, I mean, excuse me, the superintendent has come out with, and listening to a, a departing member, which uh, it's sad to see him go. Um, approximately a month, a month and a half ago, the negativity stepped up in politics because it's a political season. It's uh, a little worse than I've seen it in past years, and I've been here since 1985 on various boards and commissions. The name calling, has been atrocious, such as dysfunctional school committee, not dressed right, bullies, anonymous negative blogs attacking volunteers, family members, and employees. The district has moved forward despite the negativity due to the lack of, 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 of some sort of thought process when you're thinking about your civic pride, and that's all I'd like to see is Southbridge rise to its greatness again, especially in education. Ask yourself, where were we? Where are we? Where we're going? Well, just an overview and a quick moment and a reminder as a veteran school committee member. It wasn't too long ago we had a $3.6 million deficit, a mass exodus of teachers, administrators, and students out of the Southbridge school system. At that point, there were a lot of people that got involved here. Mr. DeGregorio was one of them, and I, and I praise him, along with school committee members that are now sitting here. Seven balanced budgets, no deficits. A turnaround plan that was very successful that graduated into an accelerated improvement plan. Wonderful planning, more execution on the way. A realignment of curriculum, constantly working on curriculum, not letting it fall behind with a very qualified uh, curriculum team working hard behind the scenes. The reconfiguration of grade one through five at Charlton Street and West Street with a pre-K center. This was to service parents that were on PTAs, to service children in a better way, where all the studies show that staying in a building and being stable is better for our children. As we go forward, we built a $76 million middle high school. We'll be opening in September, on time, under budget, and no tax hike. Working diligently for the reuse, because our work doesn't stop by just leaving buildings and moving into the new one. As a school committee, we're continuing, continuously working with our professionals to bring our children back to a collaborative, to bring our children into town, keep our, our uh, early childhood intervention. The options are unlimited. The entrepreneurial government that, that we are thinking as will make Southbridge High a profitable building. I would like to see, see this happen. And, 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 you know, when you talk about it, it's all about our children. It's all about our Southbridge pride. There are people running for government, and I, and I tip my hat, there are very good people running for government. Nobody is a bad person that's running for government. Anybody that wants to volunteer for this job, you must salute them. But the negativity and the smoke and mirrors that I've seen in the past month and a half, which it's a political season, and I understand that. What we have to do is just sit back as an electorate and as a people and look at ourselves. Are we proud of the way we beat each other up? Are we proud? of we know how to hate and, and, and kill a politician that is a volunteer. 
But you all have to sit back and ask yourself one question. If I may quote the great, great Ronald Reagan, are we better off now than nine years ago? Answer that question to yourself. And when you go to the ballot, you vote your conscience. Thank you. Thank you. On a couple other notes, um, well, one other note uh, before I go. Does anybody else have anything? Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity, along with uh, Mr. Lazo was there as, as well. Uh, the Southbridge Rotary Club every year um, selects students from Southbridge High School to represent our community in the Rotary Youth Leadership Academy, uh, or awards, which is held at Worcester State College. Um, and the process is that these students have to go before a panel at the Rotary Club and be interviewed and then be selected to represent our community. This year we had seven students that were selected. We had Elise Pena, Orlando Quesada, Megan Gowley, Hannah Lazo, Aaron Jovan, Casey Mitchell, and Rosa Brito. Uh, those, uh, out of those seven, six were able to attend. First, I want to thank the Rotary Club because they sponsored these kids to go there for the weekend, $250. The purpose of this is to instill leadership skills in those students and have them bring them back to the community. One of our former students, Courtney Salmon, who graduated from Selfridge High School a number of years ago, has been involved in Ryler, and, and uh, yesterday she was recognized for six years as a Selfridge High School graduate that has continued with that program and given back. The challenge was to these six students to come back into Selfridge High School in the community and give back and show leadership skills. But I want, to know, I want you to know that we should be proud of our students that we're producing out of Southbridge High School. Ms. Rosa Brito, who has, spo uh, who has, who has been a uh, spoken student here and has done a great job and a great presentation to us about a uh, uh, survey that she had done. She was recognized out of 167 students for her uh, community service project that she wishes to bring back to the town of Southbridge. What a fine young example to our community we should be proud of those students, all of those students, and, and we lose sight of that too often. We talk about the negativity, but we have great kids that we're producing out of, this, uh, out of this community, out of this high school. I congratulate Rosa, and I congratulate those uh, other five students that participated in that program, and I hope they do take up the challenge of coming back to the community and instilling what they've learned to make better leaders out of all of us and to show true leadership in the community uh, and challenge all of us. So thank you to those young ladies. Okay, with that, I have nothing else on the new business. Okay, next, um, school committee reports, curriculum, Mr. Gregorio. Last Tuesday was my last curriculum subcommittee meeting and it was the best meeting that we've had in nine damn years. Figures. <laughs> uh, it dealt with evolution and creativity and creation, rather, uh, and how we would go about, if we were to go about, teaching something like that in school. And it, it really came down to, would you teach it as a philosophy, or would you teach it uh, historically, would you teach it scientifically? Uh, there were several people, all of whom were very well schooled, in both sides of that, both creation and evolution, and several other different theories uh, that are also out there. Uh, we scratched the surface, to be honest with you. I think that uh, the open minds that sat around that table were, uh, were incredible. They really were. They, I expected uh, after the first three or four minutes, I'm sure the superintendent felt the same way I did. After the first three or four minutes, I thought there was going to be a fight. <laughs> but then after everybody just really put their minds together and the discussion that we had for the next hour or so, if you can take kids and have a discussion <coughs> like that for 45 minutes, you would be you could sit there and you'd be enthralled as a teacher. You wouldn't even have to moderate, you would just have to sit there and let them talk. It doesn't have to come down to who, you know, whose God is the real God 
or what religion is the true religion. That's not what this was about. It's about the philosoph philosophical outlook of how the world and how the universe and how matter and how everything else possibly came into being. It's philo philosophy. It's not religion in that respect. We just, as I said, scratched the surface. Unfortunately, like I said, it's my last meeting. And uh, I really, really, really uh, am excited for the people that are going to be taking part in this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Policy? Yes, yes, no reports and no meetings scheduled. Thank you. Budget, there's no meeting, no report. Collective bargaining, Mr. Lazo? No report at this time. Building committee? Uh, building committee, we had a tour on 6-16-2012. Uh, um, it was an outstanding tour. It was, it was two, two sessions. It was uh, approximately 160 people. We toured with the fifth graders, which was uh, quite an experience. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Eric Ely uh, for, uh, for thinking of the, the kids that are going to be actually going to the middle school. They got a flavor of what they're going to see, which I think uh, is like an icebreaker for some of the young kids. And I know that a lot of the parents and uh, of the eighth graders uh, have been up to see, you know, what the high school is going to be like. And parents have been touring, and we've been. Uh, we had a tour with the Southbridge Credit Union on the 21st. Uh, the bank board, who uh, put up approximately $50,000 to retrofit the Credit Union Bank, part of our program at Southbridge High School, they wanted uh, to come up and take a look at it. They were. Uh, in awe about the building, and they were very excited um, uh, for Southbridge, uh, for real estate prices, and for uh, the movement that uh, the educational group in town is making on this building. Uh, we have Southbridge Savings Bank on the 26th, and if anybody else would like to tour the school again, uh, call the superintendent. The superintendent is scheduled. Uh, we'll get the hot hats, and we'll go up there, and if there's two people, I'll go up. Um, anything to put out the negativity. People have come up with so many different things about the school and uh, once you go there, once you hear the facts, uh, the smoke and mirrors all go away and it's real, it's really there, it's really ours, it's really not built on a dump, it's uh, really a really 6 through 12 school. And I think we are uh, on the, uh, the cusp of greatness again where we can compete. We built this school one mile off the Chowton border. We're already getting phone calls from Chowton uh, residents that feel that Southbridge High School, and they've toured with other, other groups with me, um, that is a viable uh, a school. And I think that uh, with the technology portion, it's way ahead of anybody around us. We've had an employee from the uh, Dudley Middle School, uh, Child Middle School, I should say, and one uh, employee from Tantasco, both residents live in Southbridge. And their exact quote to me after the tour was, you've got it all over us. So I think that the building committee, uh, town council, there were so many uh, school committee, this school committee here, uh, had uh, their fingerprints on this. And I think the design with the administration and, and teachers, not professionals, just put the stamp of approval on it. It's worth seeing. We're, uh, we're pretty well completed. We're going, uh, we're, right now they're uh, moving right out the front door and they're doing the landscaping, pavers, and finished tiling and kitchen equipment. They put the epoxy down. Um, if if uh, Southbridge didn't think they could compete with the old shoe, Wait when they see this one. This one here is worth competing, uh, and it's worth putting your best uh, foot forward. We actually have something to compete with now. So uh, the only thing I can say is to the surrounding towns, look out. Here we come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ely, I, I know on the other day that you commented that there was uh, actually students that are school choice and in. Is that correct? Can you confirm I've had, that? I've had uh, about four letters from parents requesting school choice in for next year, all of which I have approved. So. Uh, it's at least the first time since I've been here, you know, in, uh, going into my third year, that, that, uh, that we've had students who have choiced in. Usually you hear about kids leaving. I, I haven't had that. I've had kids who are actually asking to come here. Choicing in from other towns, Eric? Yes. Awesome. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just take a quick second. If I may quote the chairman, he said, when we pass the school, build it and they will come. It is, it's going to take a little while for everybody to understand that we are here and we are different, but they are going to come. It's worth it all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to executive session. Vote to go in executive session to one discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining for union, non union personnel. A litigation to the extent that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the governmental body pursuant to Chapter 30A, Section 21, Part 3. So moved. Second. <coughs> Roll call. Yes. 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 
Yes. School committee will reconvene in open session for the purposes of adjournment only. Thank you. Come back. <laughs> right in front of